Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, so my presentation today is dealing with the topic of bank power and the struggle for euro-dollar market supremacy. And these are the first sort of fragmentary thoughts of mine on a chapter from my PhD thesis, which is dealing with the political economy of Anglo-American relations, particularly post-Second World War. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is to, uh, first of all, briefly define the euro-dollar market and give uh, a very concise historical background. I'm then going to present a few different interpretations of, of uh, what the significance of the euro-dollar market was for the global economy before then presenting my own provisional arguments uh, on the topic and, and showing some data that I've collected from the Bank of England quarterly bulletin. And then finally, I'll just recap and suggest some questions for further research. So first of all, what is the euro-dollar market um, and how did it come to be? Well, it essentially refers to the gathering and investing of short-term dollars in foreign markets, um, with particular reference to the, the use of the dollar outside of U.S. national jurisdiction. And historically, uh, London has been the, the main center for the euro-dollar market. So it emerged out of the context of the 1950s. Um, and after the Second World War, European banks, uh, particularly those in the UK, began to revive the practice of taking dollar deposits. And instead of placing these dollars in New York, uh, they began to lend them out to other European banks in order to finance international trade. It was actually the Midland Bank in, in Britain in 1955 that uh, first began to use dollars for domestic purposes within the UK. And the market really started to take on momentum after 1957. Um, this is because the repeated crises of sterling in Britain after the Second World War meant that the government imposed restrictions on the use of sterling for financing trade between third parties. And so what we see here is the beginning in the, the shift from the significance of sterling as an international currency towards the supremacy of the dollar as the principal international currency. So the restrictions on sterling meant that the dollar became uh, increasingly prioritized as the currency for international trade. Um, it was the cheapest and readiest source of international trade credit. And we have to situate this within the context of what started to happen in the 1960s, which is the world moved from the situation of the dollar gap, in which uh, particularly Western European countries were short of dollars, to the dollar glut of the 1960s, brought on by uh, US balance of payments deficits and uh, heavy overseas spending particularly on the war in Vietnam. The important thing to remember about the euro-dollar market is that it's a, it was, at least at the time of its origin, uh, an unregulated market. And so London had established itself as a zone of relative freedom from regulation, as a means to attract um, international credit. So we compare this to the United States, for instance, where regulation Q meant that there were interest rate ceilings imposed on short-term deposits. And this is a key factor in explaining why the euro-dollar market in London took on such significance. Okay, now I want to just sort of talk about some different interpretations of the significance of the euro-dollar market briefly. So a lot's been made about the emergence of the euro-dollar market and its significance for the global economy. And I think it's unanimously understood to be a key turning point in the history of international finance. Um, it's a key moment in the liberalization of international capital markets that provided ready capital for the expansion of trade and investment associated with uh, the acceleration of globalization in the 1950s and 60s. It also played a key role in undermining the capital controls and monetary management in place under the Bretton Woods system and that it kind of cradled a more liberalizing tendency in the global economy. So Panitch and Gindin, um, in their theory of U.S. imperialism, put quite a lot of stock in the significance of the euro-dollar market as a moment in which European capital markets were brought closer into a hub-and-spokes relationship 
with the money market in New York. Um, and so they suggest that the euro dollar market moved the city and European finance in general further into the American imperial embrace. Gary Byrne, by contrast, um, has focused his analysis more on what the domestic implications of the emergence of the euro dollar market were in terms of the balance of power between institutions within the British state. And for Byrne, what's significant is that it reoriented the center of institutional power within Britain uh, back to the position in which it had been prior to the collapse of the gold standard in 1931. So he suggests that what we see with the emergence of the euro dollar market is the re-establishment of the primacy of the city Bank of England and Treasury nexus as the kind of fulcrum, fulcrum driving British government policy. Uh, Yusuf Cassis, the historian of international finance, suggests that the euro dollar market's uh, main impact was that it detached the interests of the city of London more and more from that of the British currency and the British economy. And although it strengthened London's international role as a financial center, um, American banks were nonetheless able to take full advantage of the situation and, and were subsequently able to dominate the euro dollar market and integrate it into their global strategy. And this is something that I'm sort of interested in focusing on in particular, the fact that this went from being originally a market dominated by the British banks in its infancy to something that was quickly uh, taken over by American banks as they expanded into London. Stefano Battiosi suggests that the euro dollar market constituted a potential challenge brought by European banks posed to American banks at the source of their post-war hegemony, their ability to mediate worldwide dollar liquidity. But he goes on to say that it was a challenge that was effectively met by the American banks, um, who reached an undisputed dominant position in the euro dollar market during the 1960s. So what does all of this mean in terms of bank power and Anglo-American relations? Um, the kind of questions that I'm interested in here for my future research is how the euro dollar market plays a part in the interactive development between British and American capitalism and the decline of British power vis-a-vis -vis America in the post-war era. How is the changing balance of power between British and American banks embedded within the broader framework of Anglo-American relations? <coughs> and how might a capitalist power approach, um, as articulated by Nitzan and Bickler, facilitate our understanding of these kind of questions? I think in the broadest sense, we need to understand the rise of the euro dollar market as intimately connected with the decline of the British Empire, and in particular the demise of sterling as an international top currency, as Susan Strange would, would describe it which was then subsequently replaced by the US dollar. So I'm now going to move to some of the data that I've been collecting on the issue, um, just to show the changing market share between the different banks. Um, I'm using the current account deposits of overseas residents here as a kind of proxy for euro dollar market um, deposits, basically. So, um, and at this point, with this graph, it's basically sterling and other, other currencies too. Okay, so this second graph here um, shows American banks' overseas residence deposits. But in this graph, I've plotted sterling against uh, other currency deposits. And what we see quite clearly with the American banks um, is that the massive increase in deposits is largely to do with uh, currencies other than sterling being deposited. Um, and we know for a fact that these deposits were mainly in, in US dollars, essentially. Okay, by contrast, the British Overseas and Commonwealth Banks, uh, which you'll remember from the, the previous graph, with the other uh, most significant players in the market, experienced a much more gradual and lesser increase in non-sterling deposits, although they did begin from a higher uh, base point of sterling deposits. So where we see that change in the initial graph, it's essentially to do with the massive proliferation of non-sterling deposits in those American banks. And we can use that quite clearly as a proxy for the acceleration of uh, euro dollar market size. Uh, 
Okay, so my argument on this is basically to initially contend uh, Panitch and Gindan's assertion that the development of the euro dollar market was some kind of, seemed to be some kind of part of a purposive imperial strategy of integrating um, European financial markets into the American matrix. I think, in fact, um, what we see is corporate actors operating in response to changing regulatory and monetary conditions within the US and UK. And so we might want to think of this in terms of uh, differential regulation. So these, these banks were kind of playing off different regulatory conditions in different territorial spaces um, to maximize profit-making possibility relative to one another. And we see, um, so if we go back to this graph, uh, what we see is that with the, the US deposits increase, particularly after 1964, that's where we see the the most steep and consistent increase. And this is to do with changing monetary conditions in the United States in the early 1960s, particularly after 1964, where we see the imposition of tight money and credit restraints as American policymakers became more and more concerned with the growing balance of payments deficit and how, how that would affect their standing in the world. And so as these regulatory conditions in the US were tightened, and there were limits imposed on American banks' lending and deposit taking, they then moved their operations more and more into London. And this is because British banking was effectively self-regulating prior to the Banking Supervision Act of 1979. So what we see in Britain is an entirely different regulatory context uh, from that which is experienced in the US. So what does all of this mean in terms of, of dominant capital and in terms of Nitsen and Bickler's idea of uh, cycles and regimes of differential accumulation. Well, to contextualize it historically, what's interesting about the American bank's expansion into London is that this came after a major wave of mergers and acquisitions within New York uh, from the mid-1950s up until 1960. Uh, so, for instance, the Chase National Bank merged with the Bank of Manhattan and Bronx County Trust to form the Chase Manhattan Bank. So we might therefore see the internationalization as the territorial extension of a breadth regime that took U.S. banks outside of the national envelope of accumulation. In the process, national money markets became more tightly integrated. This caused interest rate standardization as well as a transnational spatial, spatial integration between these markets. And importantly, we, although we don't have the profit data here, and that's what I need to do next, essentially, I think it most likely increased the power of dominant capital within international banking. Um, the same five American banks that dominated the market in the 1960s were still dominant in 1999 in the exact same rank order as they had been in the 1960s. So we see a remarkable stability in the kind of banks that were dominant in this foreign-oriented market um, over the last sort of 50 years. So Michael Darby suggests that you can identify two major groups of US banks in the 1960s, and he rather unimaginatively labels them large banks and small banks. Um, but he suggests that not, since 1960, the balance of power shifted away from the smaller banks. And I quote him here, the internationalization of banking in the last 25 years is part of this general struggle of large American banks to break their parochial fetters. And breaking these parochial fetters involved extending into London. Uh, what were the effects of this extension into London upon British banking? Well, it appears to me, from most of the evidence I've gathered to date, that they were extremely deleterious to the health of British banking. And they accelerated a, a process of decline uh, that really got underway intensively with decolonization and the, and the post-Second World War context. Um, the British banks, as we can see from this graph, were the major losers after a position of early dominance in the 1950s. Um, Foreign bank expansion even came to undermine the position of British clearing banks, uh, which I haven't put on this graph because they weren't major players in the euro dollar market. But by the late 60s and 1970s, these American banks, which had taken a foothold in the London market, also began to challenge clearing banks for uh, local corporate clients and sterling loans. 
So Jeffrey Jones suggested that there was a big threat from US multinational banks. The American banks, he suggests, were not simply strong competitors of the British overseas banks. They were potential predators. And he relates this to the first wave of mergers between British overseas banks in the 1950s, which he argues were conducted within the background of real or imagined American takeover threats. So Jones notes that while British banks had pioneered and dominated the first era of multinational banking, they had become modest players in the second one. So during the 1970s and 80s, Britain's overall decline continued to undermine the former competitive advantage of British banks, associated with them being sterling banks and British imperial power. US banks benefited from the expansion of US multinational corporations, as they had privileged corporate ties to these companies. British banks had much smaller capital ratios that limited their potential involvement in the euro dollar market. And they also suffered from a declining client base in the post-Second World War context. Now, an interesting way to trace the shifts in euro dollar market dominance is to examine the Bank of England reports in the 1960s. And in 1964, if we read the Bank of England quarterly bulletin, they report um, with almost with a vaguely detectable note of pride that um, accepting houses and overseas banks in the emergent euro dollar market were well equipped to play an active part in this market. And they note the dominant role of these banks in the euro dollar market. And if we contrast that to the 1970 Bank of England quarterly bulletin report, we find an analysis which basically suggests that the US banks share rose substantially over the years and stood at 54% at the end of 1969. And I quote here, the share of all other groups of banks fell, and in particular the accepting houses now only account for only 8% of the market total. So these were major losers in this competitive struggle over euro dollar market deposits. So to make a couple of concluding remarks, um, I think that the re-establishment of London's role as an international financial centre a key government objective, particularly for conservative administrations after the Second World War, came at the price of declining British banking competitiveness in an increasingly open global market. And that we can see through the early development of the euro dollar market, a key moment in the hegemonic shift from the dominance of long-standing British multinational banking to the increased dominance of American multinational banking. Um, and this was a process inextricably tied to the broader context of the decline in sterling's international standing and the increasing supremacy of the dollar as international currency. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Actually, it's in between. And thank you very much uh, for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk about two investment banking cases. One is Merrill Lynch, the other one is Bear Stearns. So um, my work is still in progress. Uh, the two cartoons actually you know, illustrate the, you know, the dire situation they were having in, the, uh, in 2008. What I am going to do is that First, I will talk about the cases briefly and then talk about the literature on capital. Uh, after highlighting the problems, I'm going to offer a uh, tentative uh, frame, uh, theoretical framework and then look at the broader macroeconomic situation and provide a kind of timeline for these two investment banks uh, that uh, they run in, into trouble and then you know, uh, analyze uh, what happened before you know, uh, summarizing my conclusions. Uh, if we remember 2008, it was a very you know, tough year for all financial institutions. There were you know, uh, three major main, uh, uh, investment banking casualties um, the first one was uh, Bear uh, Stearns. Uh, it actually, it was established in 1923. It is long history, but suddenly you know, uh, collapsed uh, 
in March 2007. Uh, and then, you know, in order to prevent um, one of the broader uh, implications of the, you know, the, the uh, collapsing share prices, almost you know, 50% in one day, uh, GP Morgan Chase agreed to buy uh, uh, Bear Stearns uh, with the you know, financial uh, help. You know, Federal Reserve uh, assured around you know, 30 billion dollars. Uh, and the second case, after six months later, actually uh, Merrill Lynch also ran into problems, and and after you know trying to solve it is financial problems. Uh, you know, it was forced to sell itself to Bank of America. So, you know, a year ago, both banks were, you know, very healthy, making uh, around a billion dollar profits. And what happened in one, you know, less than one year that, you know, these huge investment banks with, you know, around 80 something years of history collapsed. Well, the, these two investment banks and their collapse actually raise a question about what is capital. Well, no, is it a phys, you know, asset or it is a fund? You know, when I look at the literature, what I could see, you know, interestingly, you know, is that you know, first the debate has more than 100 years of history in economics. And still, very hot topic, as you know, uh, we can see here all the discussions. And you know, there are three forms I could see in the literature. The first one would argue that you know it is a physical you know, uh, asset, and John Hicks actually calls them materialists. And the second form is monetary fund. And he calls him fun, fundist. And you know, uh, my former professor and now colleague, you know, uh, Professor Nissan and his uh, collaborator Bichler, you know, actually adds a, uh, add a third category uh, and saying that capital is power. So the, those who study you know, the, the concept in, in, in the economic literature argue that both you know, Avi Cohen and from actually York University and Jan Kregel from University of Missouri at Kansas City argue that you know, economists you know, tend to emphasize either you know, asset side or material side or funding side. But there, you know, what I will argue is that today that you know, these three dimensions are important in the sense that you know the money uh, with you know, I'm going to explain that reason you know fund is important to buy asset to make more money uh, and you know, without asset tangible or intangible you know fund does not have value because you know if you look at the banking you know the business it is all about lending money uh, but at the same time, you know, this third dimension, power is important in the sense that capital is not a monopolistic you know, category or a single category. Capital you know, is a plural, and I'm going to hopefully demonstrate you how it works in the process of competition. So you know, in, the, in the literature, what I could see that you know, there, you know, this time dimension and and the role of competition or business competition have been overlooked in the process. Uh, and hopefully I, I'm going to explain that through you know, the theoretical framework uh, you know, I, I'm going to put forward based on Marx and you know, uh, Webland's understanding of uh, capital. So you know, first of all, capital in a capitalist society is an ownership category. It's all about ownership. And it has you know, the both uh, physical and monetary side, but it is a plural category. And because of it is plural nature, you know, business competition is a very important uh, role to play. And what I mean by business competition is a you know, dynamic process where 
you know, we see uh, uh, competitive behavior, uh, competition as you know, uh, behavior of individual uh, business firms, as well as as, um, as well as a mechanism that exerts control over you know, individual firms, depending on the market situations. In terms of uh, theoretical framework, you know, I work with both Marx and uh, Veblen. Why? Because you know, even though you know, there are arguments about you know, Marx's approach to capital as physical, you know, if you look at you know, uh, capital volume first, uh, actually you know, uh, Marx himself um, you know, clearly stated that you know, you know, capital is a, you know, uh, uh, takes the form of uh, uh, takes the form that first of money. First of all, what he says argue, you know, indicates that you know, in the first place, capital is about money. But you know, uh, given that the purpose of uh, capital is to make money, you know, we are talking about this process of you know, realization. You know, money buys capital, uh, commodities, but commodities not for the sake of commodities. It is because making more money. So it is a classic, you know, the realization transformation problem. And again, you know, Marx's theoretical framework is useful because you know he talks about business competition and how you know uh, business firms. Uh, uh, you know, compete each other to you know make uh, a profit. Uh, the second understanding of Marx, uh, you know, um, the, uh, capital is this social relationship, and that has to do with ownership. And ownership is sanctioned by the state uh, in the form of private property. So you know, these uh, two dimensions, you know, the capital you know, as ownership category and also having you know, uh, mon monetary and you know, physical dimensions are important, but even some Marxists actually ignore these you know, monetary dimensions, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and why is Weblen? Weblen is important in the sense that you know, the, he agrees with Marx about you know, the, uh, the nature of ca capital, you know, first that is uh, ownership category. And you know, with ownership, actually investors or the owners you know, have, he argues, the right to abuse, neglect, or inhibit, you know, um, which are actually against the interest of the society, but the ownership gives these rights to you know, busy, uh, 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 owners of the capital. And capital can be tangible and intangible, but in the first place, capital, again, it is a monetary category. Uh, however, you know, we can see in the you know, form of investment in tangible and intangible assets. But again, the final you know, the, uh, objective is to, is to uh, make more money. So in that sense, we see lots of you know, uh, you know, commonalities between Marx and Weblen. Uh, first, you know, it, is, uh, it is plural. Uh, it is ownership category, it is fund, and also it is you know, the physical category. So, you know, after you know, seeing this framework, you know, uh, uh, the next thing I hopefully I'm going to show you is to you know, outline the broader you know, uh, structure, uh, conditions uh, about the on the American economy in 2006 uh, before getting into the individual cases. Well, 2005 and 6 uh, was a kind of turning point in uh, in the history of you know American uh, economy uh, with reference to housing values. You know the 2005 and 6 kind of plateaued and slowly you know started declining. And also economic growth you know, uh, uh, started to slow down you know, compared to the previous years. And you know, what does that mean was that you know, uh, 
when the economy doesn't grow anymore, you know, the, it means that there are few profit opportunities. And you know, at the same time, you know, the competition becomes more intense for you know, two reasons, especially in the United States. Uh, the first one is that you know, more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, banks enter into you know, the mortgage business from both commercial and investment banking sites. And secondly, actually, industrial investment did not take off as much as the investment banks you know, the, uh, hoped for uh, uh, between 2001 and 2006. That was one of the reasons why investment banks actually got into the mortgage business. You know, they couldn't lend money to, you know, uh, lend money to uh, industrial players, and, and therefore they didn't want to sit on you know, huge uh, piles of money uh, because you know, they are uh, about you know, lending and borrowing in the first place. Then intense competition actually resulted in you know, the decreasing profit margins. And uh, here, the, you know, this broader uh, you know, macroeconomic conditions, we can see you know, this, the first uh, this orange is you know, GTB growth you know, uh, dipping and then increasing, uh, peaking around 2004, and then slowing down. Uh, four and five. And the second one actually is this uh, interest rate, this green line. As you can see, we're not, uh, until 3000 and, uh, 2003, you know, it declined significantly. Banks you know, could not uh, find new opportunities and therefore you know, they started uh, lending to you know, these risky activities. And all uh, these you know, lower interest rates uh, put more pressure on banks from both commercial and, and uh, investment banking si side, and that created actually an you know, uh, intense competition in the you know, mortgage business. And another indicator is you know, unemployment rate. As you can see, you know, this uh, is declining by until 2006, 7 The next thing I would like to show you is uh, um, the amount of mortgage you know, originations and steadily increase to three, almost three uh, trillion dollars by 2006. But we could see you know, slowing down. Uh, and in 2006, actually declined a little bit, and the share of you know, subprime mortgage increased, and you know, these mortgage-based securities, uh, which were the you know, main uh, business line for investment banks, uh, you know, steadily increased. And here we can see the amount of you know, uh, foreclosures. In fact, when we look at the, you know, the prime and subprime origination you know, foreclosures as, part, as percentage of uh, respective figures, we could see that foreclosures for subprime was you know, uh, stable. What it means uh, basically that you know, the problem uh, the, or the source of problem was the decline in the housing prices. With what it was not, you know, that uh, you know, delinquency or flow, uh, foreclosure. It was mainly about the you know, decline in you know, uh, housing price that created the you know, the problem first. And here we see the you know, number of employees and banks. You know, these are all you know banking institutions in the United States. This is the percentage change. The first line is number of institutions as percentage change. We can see that after 2003, you know, the, the decline you know, stopped or you know, became lesser. And em in employment-wise, we can see you know, the banks after 2002 started to actually you know, they expand their business. And that you know, went up until 2005. And after that, you know, they started shrinking again. 
And this is the, you know, the uh, rate of return uh, as percentage of total assets for all you know, financial institutions. What we can see is that you know, um, interest income, if you look at the you know, uh, net interest income, you know, it was around 3% and declining in general. But, you know, what kept banks running, you know, in mid-2000s was this, you know, uh, non-interest income. The, the fees banks will charge to, you know, both the, uh, their customers and to each other. You know, that kept, you know, uh, banks uh, in the, you know, profitable you know, area. So, in terms of competition, we could see you know, a number of players. That, that's why I said you know, capital is not a uh, monolithic uh, category. You know, it is because of ownership, it is plural. plural and these three banks actually you know, disappeared by you know, September 2008. Um, uh, and what happened? In terms of Merrill Lynch, you know, it is uh, exposure to you know the subprime uh, market market was around fifty uh, billion you know, dollars by two thousand and six, but the, the situation got worse in two thousand and seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and in October two thousand and seven and January uh, two thousand and eight, actually you know, Merrill Lynch uh, wrote down around. Um, you know, 19, uh, 20 billion of his assets. It was significant. And then, you know, still had lots of um, you know, toxic assets on his balance sheet and, you know, tried to sell them. Actually sold in July 2008 around, you know, the value of, face value of 30.6 billion of dollars asset only to 6.7 billions. You know, you can see the huge difference. Actually, that difference is also is a kind of destruction of capital. And finally, you know, try to find investment investors from around the globe, especially from the Middle East. Uh, but you know, uh, after realizing that it couldn't manage, uh, you know, it had it was forced to sell itself to you know Bank of America. What happened to Beer and uh, Beer Stearns? In that case, what we see is that same thing. You know, started in 2007. Suddenly, uh, even though, as we could see earlier, you know, problems uh, were going, uh, the source of problem was going back to 2005 and 6. You know, it took some time to you know realization. That actually, that is the you know the. Uh, reason why I emphasize the time dimension, you know, the, in moving from commodity to uh, physical form to money form, and it was very difficult, you know, for Bear Stearns to, you know, do the same thing of, you know, downloading the toxic assets because everybody, uh, everybody else was doing the same thing, and it tried to, you know, deal with the, uh, these problems. Uh, like what uh, Marilyn Lynch, uh, Mary Lynch tried to do, but uh, what happened? You know, in 2000, actually, uh, 8 March 13 was that this car Carly Capital, you know, um, which Bear and Stearns owned around, you know, 15 percent, uh, collapsed suddenly. Yeah, and then. Uh, with this 22 billion of, uh, dollars of exposure to the you know, uh, mortgage uh, market. And then suddenly investors realized that even you know, the Beer and Stearns could not you know, the finance its daily transactions and they stopped doing business. Actually, that you know, is the power of you know, part, uh, actors in the market to honor their you know, transactions and also get into you know, relationships with each other. Once you know, the players stop lending and borrowing uh, from uh, beer stores, the, uh, the company didn't have another you know, choice but to, you know, again, uh, to sell itself to GP Morgan at a fraction of it is, you know, market value. 
And what happened here? You know, overall, what we can say that you know, competition as a mechanism was very forceful after you know, 2003. Uh, Lehman Brothers and Beer Stearns got into the market in the first place in 2003. Uh, uh, Merrill Lynch entered the market in late 2005 and 6. Uh, 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 by buying you know, other you know, the mortgage originators. So here, you know, the investment banking in terms of power relations is based on you know, short-term lending, you know, based giving assets and borrowing, and then, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, when the asset values decline and also, you know, share price decline, and that created balance sheet problems for the banks, and then you know they could not uh, carry out transactions, uh, and the result was a kind of classic run on the bank by banks actually, not the depositors in you know commercial banks we saw historically. You know, as a conclusion, what I could say is that you know, uh, you know capital has these three dimensions: you know, physical assets, uh, funds, and power. And they are taking advantage of what the society you know, sees as value. And it is a plural category. Why? Because, because of ownership and business competition is very important to understand how the dynamics uh, of the market uh, play out. And in that process, you know, this time and realization uh, of or you know, conversion of uh, money from commodity to, or physical assets to money <clears throat> is you know, highly critical. At the end of the day, there are always winners and losers. It means that actually capital is also a category for redistributing wealth in the society. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Madan Ostage. I'm a MA candidate here at York University studying political science. And I'll be sharing with you today some of my preliminary findings from a research project on corporate taxation with an emphasis on American banking, something that I hope will become my major research paper down the line. Now, what got me into this topic is essentially my own ignorance. I really didn't know much about corporations, and much of what I did know, both in academia and outside of it, came from conventional wisdom that relied on anecdotal evidence and uh, I wasn't very satisfied with what I knew, and I wanted, uh, I wanted more. So what I did is I took the capitalist power approach, and I tried to figure out exactly how corporations have evolved. We hear all the time that corporations are strong, they are at the commanding heights of the economy, they have grown from relative humility to, to taking up dominant place in modern capitalism. But I wanted to try to quantify this, and with the capitalist power approach, we have the tools to do so, and that is through capital as power, as the title suggests. So what I've done, essentially, is to take cap corporate profits. Uh, the issue was raised earlier, how do you quantify power? It is difficult. When it comes to corporate power, it's quite plain to see that uh, profitability is a central component of co corporate power. And measuring that will give us a proxy on how well they've been doing. Now, that was exceptionally difficult, but what I was more interested in was how taxation affected uh, corporate profitability. And the relationship is fairly straightforward. Uh, presumably, if you're taxed less, you can profit more quickly, retain more of your profits. Corporations, after all, are taxed on, are taxed on profits. And if you are taxed uh, more, it stagnates your capital accumulation. So what I've done is I juxtaposed in figure one. If you're following me with the, uh, with the handout. It's a bit too big. Right. Corporate profits against uh, effective corporate tax rates. Now, the corporate profits here are strictly nominal. I didn't fix for inflation. I didn't compare it to any sort of other income. I just took corporate profits in general just to see the slope and how it evolves. This is a logarithmic scale, so don't look at it and say, wow, corporate profits have increased a thousandfold. Yes, they have, but compared to what? So you shouldn't really worry about that. What I'm mostly interested in here is 
its relationship to the effective tax rate. And when I say effective tax rate, you should understand that I'm not talking about the statutory tax rate written in law. I'm not talking about what some bureaucrat is trying to impose as 50% on all your profits. That may be the case, but corporations can get away with perhaps 40%. They may have to pay much more, much less. It depends. There are many, uh, many things to consider, capital losses versus capital gains. Uh, tax evasion, uh, outsourcing, many different things. Suffice it to say that corporations are pretty good at not having to pay tax. Um, but back to the graph. What we see here is, first of all, a mild, subtle, but nevertheless existent inverse relationship between the effective tax rate and the uh, pre-tax corporate profit, such that if the corporate tax rate goes up, uh, we see that pre-tax corporate profits tend to stagnate and vice versa. Now, this is not the biggest deal. It's not really the, the point of my presentation. I'm just trying to set up what's to come. And uh, the more important thing here is the effective tax rate itself. After the Great Depression and World War II, which were obviously crises-ridden periods of capitalist history, when we get to, I suppose, the political economic normalcy, business as usual, we see that uh, from a high of around 56% in 1943, at which point, presumably, uh, there was a high demand on uh, military, from the military uh, to raise funds for the war effort. It fell all the way down to around 25% in 2009. Now, this is based on raw data. All the data I have here graphically presented are smooth, meaning that looking at five-year averages such that each point on the graph is actually the average, weight average uh, of the last five years. So when I'm, when I'm saying it fell from 56 to 25, that is in raw data, uh, just, just so you know. And uh, what I found besides this, when I asked myself, okay, well, this is great, and it's meaningful in and of itself, but to say that corporate profits are going down, it's a, it's a gross generalization. Corporations are very diverse. There are many different kinds of corporations, many different sizes of corporations, so I decided to disaggregate. When I did this, it really kind of knocked my socks off, as you'll see. So if you think that corporations are being undertaxed, take a look at figure number two. What we see here is a huge disparity between the effective corporate tax rate and the effective corporate tax rate facing banking in particular. In fact, the average uh, difference and this is now based on smooth data, so maybe a little bit distorted, is 17%. There's a typo there that I corrected with my pen. Hopefully it's legible. 17% from 1929 to 2008. Banks have paid 17% less in taxes than the average corporation, which is kind of significant, to say the least. Meanwhile, after World War II, um, we see that from a low around 4% in 1944, the uh, share of pre-tax banking profits and all pre-tax corporate profit. In other words, out of all the profits that have been uh, accumulated by corporations, that part, which is belonging to banks, has gone up all the way to 32% in 2002, only to come back down to around 14% by 2007. And this is, again, based on raw data. Unfortunately, I don't have, I don't have access yet to uh, the data over the past few years. I emailed the gentleman... Uh, who was in charge of the database I was using at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And he basically informed me that the IRS has to clear it or something like that. It wasn't quite clear, but it's unfortunate because as we've seen in the previous presentation, uh, a lot of bad things have happened to banks uh, in the past few years given the crisis. So it'd be interesting to see how this has evolved. I would like to point out, however, that <clears throat> in the 1980s, we see banks, I didn't emphasize this um, below, I should have, that the effective banking tax rate has gone down. In the smooth data, it looks like it's around 15. It's probably around a few percent. So they've paid almost nothing in the 80s. And we also see that their share in corporate profits has gone down tremendously for that period. Um, this corresponds to, I'm not really sure what it means. Perhaps it's the Volcker shock where the Federal Reserve hiked interest rates and discouraged interbank lending, or perhaps it's something to do with neoliberalism. But uh, I'll have to defer speculation because I really can't tell based on this data. But uh, there's more. Banks themselves as a sector are more specific than just plain corporations, but 
even within banks, there's a great deal of diversity. So what I've done <coughs> in uh, figure number three, is I've disaggregated, excuse me, I've disaggregated along the lines of uh, size by total assets. What I've done is essentially taken the top 20 bank holding corporate uh, companies, which are more or less the same thing as banks in terms of uh, size and, and makeup, by total assets in 2000. So in the year 2000, the top 20 corporations, I've taken them, looked at all their uh, profit data from 1960 to, I believe, all the way to 2010. I guess that data was available, or 2009. Excuse me, 2008, yeah. 2008, uh, and I, what I found is kind of a progressive tax scheme, which perhaps contradicts what Sandy told us earlier. I'm not sure I understood that. Uh, maybe you can get back to us. But what, what we see here is that the largest banks by, by total assets have been taxed at a higher rate, effectively, again, not in statutory terms, than the effective tax rate for all banks. And this, again, implies heavily progressive tax scheme. And so, <clears throat> I, by the way, I, I'm, I'm terming these, these banks here uh, as dominant capital now. That's a very particular term introduced not by myself, but by someone else. I don't want to abuse it. Uh, I'm using it simply because Presumably, these banks, by virtue of being large, are able to beat the average in terms of accumulation. I'm not sure about that, but I didn't know what else to call them. Uh, apologies for that. But what I want to also like to point out is that these, uh, this data series is, is not complete in the sense that for certain banks, and there's a list of them in, by, in terms of ticker symbols in the footnote, 20 of them, uh, I don't remember all the names, but not all of them have their data from all the way from 1960 to 19, uh, or excuse me, from 2008. Some of them have only for 10 years, some of them have for 20 years, but on the whole, it turned out pretty well. The reason I chose the number 20 is not because it's some magical number, it's simply because it looked out the, nice, the nicest graphically. When I looked at it, in ter when I looked at the top 10, the top five, the top 15, top 30, they all look pretty much the same, just messier, and this, is, this was the nicest variation I could find. Fortunately, it doesn't go back beyond 1960. The, individual bank data, but we can see that it's quite a difference. So while corporations have had their tax, effective tax rates uh, decrease and banks have particularly managed to sway this in their favor somehow, I don't know how, and this is no coincidence and it's not a mistake on the part of the regulators, and I'm sure they are aware, the top banks at the same time within the sector have not been able to, shall we say, enjoy a favorable uh, tax burden. So this begets some very big questions. How is it that corporations have done this? Uh, how is it that banks have gotten away with what seems like highway robbery and just managed to accumulate a, a tremendous space compared to other corporations while enjoying a very fa favorable tax rate? And why is it that the uh, dominant banks have been taxed at a higher rate? Uh, some of these things are consistent, other ones seem like contradictions at this point. I, can, I cannot offer much speculation, but the data itself, I think, is, is quite enlightening. Um, I hope to study this more in the future, figure it out perhaps, maybe with your feedback, I'll learn something as well. Hope you find that interesting, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's just a small comment for, for Mladen. Um, where about the progressive tax uh, system for the banks. Be careful because you're, you're comparing two different types of profit data. Uh, the BEA adjusts their profit data in various way, ways, so they might not be comparable with the stuff taken from uh, Compostat. I can, I, there's, they wrote an article on it at the BEA, which I can send you if you want. Please. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, I have uh, a few suggestions for um, Mladen and uh, a question for Tuna. Uh, the suggestion for Mladen, in addition to what uh, Joe has indicated about uh, counting differences between the, the different set of, sets of data, 
Uh, the uh, NIPA accounts have two sets of profit data. One set is uh, with capital consumption adjustment and income valuation adjustment, and another set without it. If you are comparing uh, your profit data with uh, accounting data, probably uh, you are better off with uh, using the profits without capital consumption adjustment and income valuation adjustment. They are closer to the definition of the accounting data. And another point you might want to consider is that smaller banks, there are many banks in the US, there are thousands of them, and many of them experience losses. And, and these losses will end up uh, being taxed at zero. So that might actually uh, account for the major difference, because the large banks tend to be profitable, where small banks can be profitable as well as incurring losses. So these are suggestions in terms of uh, how to explain this uh, difference that you indicated at the end. The question that I had to, to Tuna, uh, you, you were trying, I think, uh, to uh, mix uh, several approaches, but I'm not sure that I understand the reason for that mixture in terms of what is capital. Uh, it, it's quite obvious that capital has something to do with uh, tangible assets or with machines in a sense that in uh, every society, uh, power has something to do with imposing itself on society and in capitalism that society is engaged in production. Uh, but uh, the issue really, I think, is quite different. The issue boils down to quantification. So although capital has something to do with production and something to do with labor and something to do with machines, can we go uh, and actually measure these physical entities or productive entities in a way that will inform the quantities of money and credit? So that's the major area of contention. To say that capital is tangible or physical, you haven't said yet anything. Uh, so I think this is the area that uh, remains uh, unclear in your presentation. And just as a question, uh, what is exactly uh, the tangible asset sets of the banks, for example? Thank you. So uh, sure. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, measurement is a very big problem in the sense that, as I you know, indicated in the literature review, you know, uh, economists have been trying to measure it you know, for more than a century, and still, you know, as Avi Cohen's article indicates very well, and, and, and also Jan Kregel mentioned earlier, you know, that when it comes to measurement, there are lots of problems. I think that has to do with, again, what the society values as a whole. You know, and that what the society values changes over time, and the owners of the capital try to actually get their share uh, in uh, in competition with one against another. So you know, that I don't think that you know we can quant uh, measure it properly. And as you know, the literature very well. There are lots of. You know, discussions, debates, how to measure. Should we measure, you know, the assets as the part of, you know, uh, cost of production or whether their, you know, future, you know, earning capacity? And you do, you know, as future earning capacity, even that can, uh, in, you know, in that uh, quantification, you know, uh, there are problems again with you know how to uh, bring interest rate into the you know the equation uh, because you know quant change in the quantity of capital may be due to you know increase in the you know the uh, physical assets or it may be due to you know a increase in the interest rate so you know I do not want to go to that you know part because. It has been a century-year-old discussion, and <laughs> I don't think that we can solve it here. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm Aladdin. Uh, my name is Eric. Well, we met briefly before. Um, look, I just want to ask you, uh, on the, your last graph, 
this is, uh, you mentioned this kind of counterintuitive. You see a higher tax rate for the biggest or what you call the dominant banks. I mean, uh, you left that up for a speculation, but I, I kind of have a, a sense that you have a hunch. So I was just wondering uh, what that might be, because I'm sure you have one. Thank you for your question. The only really reason I said that is I didn't want to give the impression, I thought I maybe gave the impression that if you're enjoying higher taxes, it must be because of lower profitability. So I, if you were to, to take that as my hypothesis, which is not really what I'm saying, you may have inferred that uh, or expected that dominant banks would be taxed at a lower rate, which they were not. It was probably something I should have not said. So good call. Yes. Thanks very much. This is also to Mladen about the banking taxes. This is not an area on which I claim any expertise at all, but the question relates to whether these are national accounts and therefore whether profits may be hidden elsewhere, either in off-balance sheet transactions, offshore in tax havens or elsewhere and therefore be taxed effectively at nil or at a much lower rate and whether therefore you should be looking at the taxes paid within a particular national jurisdiction by banks and on their activities within that national jurisdiction or globally and to what extent off balance sheet operations, the use of tax havens and so forth might lead to different calculations. Well, if that was a question, then I'd respond with uh, that I'm aware of this and it had occurred to me, but I simply had no way of measuring at this point. I just went with what the uh, BEA gave me, and uh, I broke it down sectorally. Actually, uh, this was this took quite a bit more calculation that meets the eye. It's not like they had that category that says banking. They had depository institution, non-depository institutions, uh, credit agencies, and the guy I, I, I mentioned earlier told me how to add it all up, and it was quite something and there is within these tables something called the rest of the world but before tax and after tax for the rest of the world is the same which like you said it's not being taxed but i don't know what part of that is banking what part of that isn't banking so it is it is an excellent point i wish i knew and i hope to someday so thank you probably not thank you um, a question for Mladen as well. Um, well, uh, more of a comment. Um, it's it just I was working uh, on Eli Lilly, so it's one of the big pharma corporation. Uh, Eli Lilly, 60% of, it, of its activities, it's in the United States. 60% of its sales, it's in the United States as well. But it's paying only 0.7% of its taxes in the United States. Basically, in terms of uh, 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 intra-firm trade, capacity to basically evade fiscality is kind of important. Uh, um, just a question, why do you focus on uh, uh, the effect effective tax rate in the US? Uh, basically, you have 20 uh, uh, dominant banks, just take the annual reports, so you have uh, uh, pre-tax profits versus declaration of everything they, they paid in taxes during that year, so that might be something interesting to basically ask the question in global terms instead of just in the United States. To be perfectly honest, the reason I chose the United States is uh, historically it's an important place for a capitalist development uh, corporation itself. Um, but for the most part, it's because the data was available and it's what I wanted to start with. You're absolutely right that today corporations are multinational in nature. They, they exist in many different countries. In a sense, you could say they don't exist in any country at all but they're still headquartered somewhere and you have to you have to measure it somehow and this is simply the way I approached it. Uh, certainly, if we think about, for example, when I did the top 20 bank holding companies, how much of this is actually in the United States, really, when you think about it. Uh, so that's, that's an excellent point. I, I recognize the importance of a multinational approach, but at this point, it's way over my head. I, I wouldn't know how to approach that, although I, I'm working on it. And John, oh, one at the top. Hello. 
Um, allow me a small and quite simple philosophical uh, remark um, about the fact that uh, we should question, of course, uh, our uh, will to measure uh, power and ask ourselves if power is not an ideology of measurement and uh, an ideology of quantity that, um, of course, uh, presupposes that uh, presupposes realities that are measurable. We are all familiar with uh, Plato quoting Protagoras as man being the measure of all things. And from that sentence to another sentence that would be all things are measurable uh, leads us to uh, what I would call as a, a, one of the possible definitions of what uh, leads to a creator is the power to measure and the power to define what is the measure. And this is why I think today a power is capitalist because we are uh, trapped in, uh, as Heidegger uh, put it, we are trapped in a, a world of realities and so therefore I think we should always um, try to avoid falling into uh, trying to measure uh, the measurement and I think this is how actually I read um, uh, Nietzsche's book is also uh, you know it's not only about um, capitalizing the power it's also uh, also about uh, powerizing uh, the capital Thank you. And uh, Jonathan again. The audience is supposed to ask questions, but I actually have a, uh, a constructive suggestion uh, for Jeremy. Uh, I'm just wondering if you uh, tried to use a data stream as a database, because uh, you, you indicated that you have uh, trouble actually getting information about the banks. And DataStream has individual corporate data going back to 1973. And these are uh, global databases. So they're not just limited to the United States. And they are available here at York. So I hope this is some sort of a constructive suggestion. Thanks. And uh, Joe? Hi, um, it's uh, two comments and a question for Jeremy. Well, one about data stream for, for the UK, it actually goes back even further to the 1950s, the data. So it could be very interesting for you. Um, so go to the Bank of England archives because it's fantastic. Um, it's very open and you can read all the correspondence between these, these lovely gentlemen in the Bank of England. Uh, it's good fun. Um, and the question is, is the rise of the euro, have you thought about this at all, is the uh, rise of the euro dollar market in London related to the, the exchange rate policy of the government? Uh, living in the UK, I, I get the impression that the pound is kind of permanently overvalued. Um, and I'm wondering if this is connected to, to the rise of the euro dollar market. So whoever wants to. Hi. Um, yes, I did have a look at the data stream data. And I think um, what I intend to do is look at the profits in the 1970s and then continue to kind of build the analysis. But unfortunately, I couldn't find for the 1960s um, the right data on British banks, and particularly the British banks that were involved in this kind of activity. So I think most of the data was on the clearing banks in Britain who weren't as involved in the euro dollar market. Um, so this is a bit of a problem, although I had the data for the American banks going back uh, sufficiently far, it wasn't available for the British banks, so I'm going to have to try and find my way around this problem somehow. Um, with regards to Joe's comment, yes, I've already been sizing up a trip to the Bank of England archives. Um, that's on my list of to-dos next time I'm in the UK. And um, yeah, regarding the exchange rate policy, I hadn't really given a great deal of thought to that, um, but what's interesting is that the late 1950s is when there are kind of uh, devaluations of, 
of sterling. So actually, the, the value of sterling was coming down uh, in this period, it, it seemed. Um, I'm not sure if partly the reluctance to trade in sterling was also to do with the unpredictability of, of how it was going to be valued over time, given the flux, fluctuations due to the, uh, the stop-go cycle in Britain, which was this periodic crisis revolving around uh, balance of payments deficit, which affected the value of sterling in the 50s and 60s. Um, but that's something I need to look into to further, basically. Yeah, a question at the, the top there. Uh, this is for Mladen, and then uh, I have a question for Tuna. Um, for Mladen, it seems that what, what seems to be missing here is that it sort of begs the question um, that it's presumably, even though dominant firms uh, within the banking sector are taxed higher, it seems that they generally banking is taxed less uh, than the effective corporate tax rate. But what I'd like to see would be interesting with the top 20 firms um, in other sectors, a uh, comparison with the top, uh, the top 20 bank, uh, banks and their effective tax rate versus other, uh, other sectors in the, in the top 20 within them. And then you can sort of, because then it's sort of a comparison among, among equals rather than within the industry um, or the sector. For Tuna, I'm, I'm very confused about um, this, this notion of competition that you seem to put a lot of emphasis on. Uh, you speak of competition as a sort of mechanism, but I guess the blending of, of all the theories sort of um, <coughs> make it kind of perplexing what is it you're actually getting at. Um, in particular, I mean, you sort of reference Marx and Veblen. Uh, from my limited understanding, Marx's understanding of competition is um, somewhat progressive in that it sort of pushes society forward um, with the falling rate of profit and so on, whereas Veblen is... Uh, it's very different. It's, uh, it's a form of sabotage, especially among the uh, sort of oligopolistic firms that you sort of focus on. Um, it's, they're not really competing on price. It's, uh, it's on sort of seizures of intangibles and so on. So I don't know what you actually mean by competition. Um, if you could clarify that for me, that would be you know, good. And we had another question uh, from the gentleman down there as well. Again, it's an outsider's view. Uh, I know, I've read that since the beginning of the accumulation of credit to launch capitalist endeavors, uh, there's been a problem. Uh, and the, what the accumulators do is try to hide what they're doing. So the Council of Vienna I think in 1311, um, after a century of Dominicans and Franciscans condemning uh, usury, uh, declared that usury was a, a mortal sin. And it really affected the people who were involved in it. Uh, and the statistics, I know from John Monroe, who wrote an article on it, uh, it's known that all kinds of lending at high interest was going on, but it is not recorded in the bank accounts, in the, in the records that were kept. Doesn't this motive persist? Is there something in modern capitalism that requires uh, that true data be recorded somehow, somewhere, so that the wielders of capital can deal with each other? Or is there no compulsion for this? Is it that the, the data you want to measure will never be available, and things do exist even though they can't be measured? Maybe that's behind your... your <laughs> not wanting to address uh, quantification of power or other such things. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Let me start with competition. Um, 
we have been hearing this, you know, the term dominant capital, but when I show you, you know, how the banking, you know, competitors uh, on the list, you, you know, we will not expect, you know, Merrill Lynch or Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers, you know, will disappear overnight. If we really, you know, they, uh, bought the idea of dominant capital. What I am trying to, you know, say that, you know, because of ownership, capital is a plural c category, and we need to understand the struggle between them because they try to get a share in the distribution of wealth in the society. So without competition, that is not possible. In terms of Marx and Weblen, you know, initially Marx's understanding of competition in the 1850s, you know, this very dynamic. But later on, you know, he talks about centralization and concentration. In that sense, you know, his understanding of competition is similar to what Weblens you know, um, would talk about in terms of cartels, in terms of curtailing, you know, the, the uh, you know, the quantity to you know the, uh, uh, sell at a higher price. Uh, my, um, what I would like to say is, is that you know, I am not against measurement, but you know, measurement has its own limitations because you know, if let's say Beer Stearns stock you know, the, um, is valued at seventy dollars you know, yesterday and then today you know, decreases by fifty percent, you know, how can we measure it? You know, so you know, measurement is you know, is again is relational you know against what you know measurement is is relational to what the society values you know one day you know stock is you know fifty dollars the other day is twenty dollars again it it depends on the perception of the society as well as the it depends on how players you know control you know resources uh, in the society uh, we you know if we didn't look at you know business competition. We will not see you know how you know things play out, and we you know get a result that we see today. You know, that's my point. Otherwise, you know, it is I am not against you know measurement, and measurement is as a, is essential for valuing you know the uh, what the society values in you know quantity. Uh, I you know. Uh, I think that's what I can say for now. Thank you. Does anyone want the I last suppose, word? I suppose there was a comment directed to me as, towards me as well uh, with respect to dominant banks versus dominant corporations. That was exactly my next step. I just didn't get there yet. Sorry, but the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll fill you in when I, when I see it. Thanks. Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, this question is for uh, Tuna. You suggest that uh, corporations can have very high capitalization one day and then the next day all of a sudden they have a very low capitalization and then how can we measure it? Uh, George Orwell wrote a book or an article on which a uh, book was based, a uh, collection, it's called Under Your Nose. Uh, I mean, aren't you actually measuring it by saying that one day it's 100 and another day it's 20? I mean, this is, and isn't this kind of a measurement how the society views these magnitudes? Uh, and in particular, how the capitalists view these magnitudes because they are constantly uh, assessing the future flow of earnings, the future uh, changes in risk, the future changes in the normal rate of return, and they distill all those um, forms of assessment into the price of the stock. So you actually have this type of assessment in front of your eyes. Whether this is a measurement of power or not is a theoretical question, but the measure of what society assesses and what society views as central is right there. So what you're suggesting is that this measure is really not the measure and there's something hiding behind it that is, is the measure. And I think this is a problematic statement because you are uh, referring to some mysterious quanta that exists out there and they are actually the reflection of what society believes and the quanta that we see in front of our eyes every day, they are some form of illusion. 
Of course, they, are, they could be illusionary in, in the sense that human beings are mistaken about the future, but they're certainly reflecting uh, the views about the future of the most important human beings in society as far as capitalism is concerned. Thanks. Maybe a quick. Thank you very much. That's a very good question, you know, the observation in terms of understanding measurement. But if, you know, when I was doing research, I could see, you know, some investment companies could see, you know, Merrill Lynch and, you know, Bear Stearns problem uh, in 2006. And some other firms will you know, measure them in a very high, you know, positive manner. So again, what I'm trying to say, there is no one measurement. And that be brings us back to, you know, as you suggest, you know, about power relations. Power, again, plays out, you know, in a relational uh, mode as one of the first presenters uh, mentioned and you know, uh, explained it earlier today in the morning. Uh, so again, there is no one measurement. If we look at, for instance, these investment companies' uh, valuations of uh, different you know, companies, we will see lots of differences. You know, again, there is no one way of you know, valuing a company. Some you know, investors say it is buy, some you know, say it is you know, neutral, and others say you know, sell. So how can we, you know, the, uh, you know, make sense of all these different valuations. That's why I'm you know, arguing that you know, capital is not a you know, the monolithic you know, category uh, because of the ownership. And ownership is actually a, a conflictual category where we see different capitals you know, are just you know, struggling and you know, cannibalizing each other if there is not enough profit opportunities. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we have a, a one-hour lunch break now, and we'll reconvene here at 2 p.m., where we have uh, two very exciting keynote addresses by Bob, Bob Jessup and Randall Ray. So please be sure to come back after you eat. Thank you very much. <laughs>